Hi, I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation, and thank you for joining me today for the next in our series of Conversations with Giants in Medicine. I'm thrilled to get a chance to speak today with the geneticist, innovator, entrepreneur, writer, and biomedical maverick, George Church of Harvard and MIT. Church developed methods for the first genomic sequencing, and his subsequent work has brought down the price of sequencing over 10 million fold. His was one of the first two research groups to get CRISPR-Cas9 to work in human cells for precision gene engineering, and he's been behind countless other scientific innovations, disruptions, and other issues in personalized genomics. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real pleasure having you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Do you think you could start by telling me a little bit about what you were like as a kid? I saw that you were born on a Air Force base in Florida. Yeah. So, so I guess one of the, uh, my, uh, I had three fathers. The first one was uh, in the Air Force uh, and had a, a variety of jobs thereafter, um, but was only with me for the first few months. Uh, I, I remained in Florida getting a really terrible education. Uh, that was a defining uh, feature. Um, but, but the result was I was getting a lot of outside of extracurricular uh, <laughs> information. I loved uh, the nature. I uh, spent a lot of time on the, in the mud flats, the swamps, and the, uh, with uh, living creatures. And, and my third father was a physician uh, that was heavily influenced by his medical bag that he carried around on house calls, a quaint anachronism. So where did the interest in science come from? Well, I didn't know any scientists any, any, uh, or any engineers uh, growing up. Uh, uh, didn't even have a science teacher until seventh grade, and, and, and uh, she was part-time. They didn't want to make a commitment to such a radical topic. Um, I didn't really get any until I left uh, Florida to, to go to Massachusetts when I was 13. So what sent you off to boarding school at Phillips Academy then? You know, my third father was, uh, uh, had been there for two years. He didn't particularly like it, but he, I think it was his gut feeling that I would, and boy, I loved it. It was just, it was just four years of heaven. It just totally uh, challenged me and stimulated uh, me to, to, uh, to just study all kinds of things, uh, things I didn't even expect, like uh, um, art, photography, and, and athletics, um, but mostly science and math. So it was during this time you got your first exposure to computers, yes? Well, not the first. The first real, real. So I, I was exposed to them at, uh, in, at at the World's Fair when I was ten, and then I started building them on my own, which were pathetic, uh, little uh, mechanical and electrical, not even electronic. Um, but yeah, it, 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 and over the first thing I, one of the first things I sought out uh, in ninth grade was uh, a, a, we had a connection to the Dartmouth computer, which nobody used. Uh, and uh, but I found that it was in a basement with a, with no chairs, no furniture, and uh, and I just started working on it. There was no manual. Uh, that was that was a big deal for me. You know. So then, what was it about the experiences during high school that led you to want to do degrees in chemistry and zoology? Well, I really wanted to to study uh, all all the maths and sciences. Uh, I didn't didn't want to never wanted to specialize to this day, uh, and so I was constantly looking for things I could do. It, it, uh, as it turned out, I, I was uh, fairly strong in math and physics, so I so I just didn't take many courses, and I didn't think I was going to be able to get a degree. But it, uh, zoology and chemistry uh, was what was what I ended up uh, doing those two degrees. And in my spare time, I would. Uh, I would do research in, in crystallography, which really did combine all of the fields in an in a obligatory way. It was not really optional not to do all, all the fields. Yeah. So how is it that you came across doing research in x-ray crystallography from a background of zoology and chemistry? Well, I was looking for a, a part-time job, basically, and I looked through the, the, the notices. and I. Wasn't in a gigantic rush, but I would look. I would, and then finally, one caught my eye, and I, and I said, "Oh yeah, that's probably that could be interesting." And I walked in for the interview, and uh, and here's this um, um, uh, young assistant professor, Sung Ho Kim, 
who is uh, quite small in comparison to the model that he's building. He's about half the size of this model for transfer RNA, which is done with, back then with wrenches and half solar mirrors and electron density maps. And I said, and after a while figuring out that it really required Fourier transforms and computers and, and deep knowledge of chemistry as, and had implications for medicine, I just said, this is, this is the whole package, I gotta do this. And uh, I just was in love. And I managed to finish my undergraduate uh, early so that otherwise I would have flunked out of undergraduate. Instead, I flunked out of graduate school. So this was at Duke, yes? Yeah. Um, so after this promising beginning in X-ray crystallography and tRNA and then leaving Duke, how did you manage to then go to Harvard Graduate School for your PhD? Uh, well, it's, it sounds mysterious at first how you can just completely flunk, I mean, it wasn't even close, uh, flunk out uh, uh, at uh, one school and then go to a, a slightly better one. Um, but I think it, it was um, that I had uh, I published five papers while I was flunking out, and, uh, and I had been accepted to Harvard Graduate School, same department before, so it just sort of felt like I couldn't have gone that much downhill uh, overnight. And they took a chance on me. They never said so. They never, they never acted like there was anything out of the ordinary at all. And I, I buckled down. I, I be, tried to become more mature overnight the second time through. I said, I'm not going to flunk out twice. You know. So after this, uh, you know, publishing five papers on tRNA and X-ray crystallography, how then did you end up somewhat switching topics to looking at more genetics and genomics, and how did you end up in the Wally Gilbert lab? Well, as it turned out that, uh, you know, Wally Gilbert, Mark Patash, Steve Harrison, Don Wiley, and others, Matt, uh, and uh, Strominger were all interested in crystallography, and so may that might have been another reason I got in, because I was one of the few uh, incoming students who had Experience. extreme experience in crystallography. But I think, uh, I sort of felt like I'd been there, done that, uh, and, uh, and I felt that every other field of biology in chemistry, to some extent, had, didn't have what crystallography had. In other words, they didn't have solid biophysics foundations, they, they didn't have uh, computers or automation. So one of the, my favorite experiences was we had a diffractometer, you know, when I'm a teenager and I see this diffractometer, the lights are off and it's just collecting data. It's like moving in this arc all day and all night. And I said, why isn't the rest of biology like that? So I set to take the lessons I learned from crystallography and apply them to adjacent fields, uh, DNA, RNA, and proteins, and, and eventually synthetic biology. Now you did a lot of things while you were in the Gilbert lab, but what was your thesis actually on? It, it was a hodgepodge of two th two things, uh, one having to do with yeast and one having to do with mammalian immunoglobulin genes, and I tried to stitch it together as uh, functions of introns. So introns had just been discovered as RNA splicing, and, and, uh, and everybody thought it was junk DNA, and I said, well, here's two experiments that happened to show that it's not, not just junk DNA. So that was, that was my the theme, but very much post hoc, after the fact, rationalization of what, it was really two different theses, yeah. And, and, ha and the part on immune goggles was not just that, it was also on a new sequencing method we call genomic sequencing. Indeed, that was gonna be my next question, was that during this time, uh, Wally Gilbert got the 1980 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, partly for genetic sequencing, yeah. and you started innovating in his lab towards things that have become the foundation for next-gen sequencing. Correct. Wally and, and uh, many people in his lab were not just interested in sequencing, but applying sequencing to methylation and protein DNA interactions. And, and I did that, but I did it on a genomic scale. Um, and it wasn't just the scale, it was completely rethinking the way that you collected the data. So re, re, sort of more of an emphasis on reprobing and imaging than on electrophoresis, which, which I think delect directly led me to uh, what would become fluorescent uh, reprobe-based uh, um, uh, imaging, uh, which was uh, next, the first of the next-gen sequencing. The other one was nanopore, which, which I got completely different route uh, on. But um, it, it clearly was, there was, there seemed like there was some 
genie that was starting to come out and it, and it needed a complete redo uh, to get to uh, what we now call next gen. So during this time, did you have any thoughts in your head of what you wanted to do with your life? Did you think that your path was on the academic, the entrepreneurial? Yeah, I don't think I was very thoughtful about my career uh, at any point, probably st still not, but definitely not then. Uh, you know, I would just mix it up, whatever seemed to be in reach. So uh, I was doing um, entrepreneurial things almost before uh, I, I knew of Biogen, which was my, my first, was Wally's first company. I was working with BioRad on the, I had written software in like 78 to, to do automatic DNA sequencing. Um, it, I actually did it in a crystallography lab uh, using a new instrument that they, that they were intimidated to, to take time to set up. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll use my rotation to set it up for you. Uh, if I get to use it for something non-crystallographic for a few weeks first. And they said, oh, that sounds like a good deal. So that's what I did is I wrote the software. And then I took it to BioRad. And, uh, but anyway, the point is I was uh, um, a mixture of academic and entrepreneur. I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't really concerned about what I was going to do long term. So you mentioned that you worked at Biogen for a little while after your PhD, but then what made you decide to do a postdoc and then why with Gail Martin, an embryonic stem cell pioneer? I actually, I had already been working with Gail and had committed to doing a postdoc in her lab before I went to Biogen. Biogen was just, it wasn't, I wasn't really, I was sort of a Biogen employee, but I was also sort of a Wally's postdoc. <clears throat> so I just continued my thesis and it was very convenient because it was close to Susumu Tanigawa's lab, who I had been collaborating with as a a graduate student, I just kept, and we just finished up, wrote a science and nature paper during that period of time. But with the, Ga the connection with Gaia was part of what I'd done as my thesis was to study how uh, B cells developed all the, all the different s progenitor stages. And I thought the ultimate progenitor stage would be embryonic, but I didn't know how to get a hold of the embryos. And so Gaia uh, provided uh, the, one of the first, world's first embryonic stem cells called PSA1, and, uh, and, I, and she just sent it to me. I didn't, I didn't know much about her work prior to that. And then I started thinking about it. I said, well, I really should learn about embryonic stem cells. Um, and I, I started thinking about homologous recombination and never got to it, but uh, I thought it would be an interesting thing to, or I didn't get to it during my postdoc. I got to it eventually. Um, so that was the motivation for going there. And, and the real motivation was my girlfriend was, uh, had to apply to the lab. She wanted to work at Stanford way in advance, like two years in advance was the waiting time for this lab. Uh, there was no waiting time at the lab that I applied for, uh, but we both applied early. And so anyways, so I was waiting at Biogen. I was there for six months waiting for the same girlfriend to finish up, and she eventually became my wife, and now we've, we've been together for 40 years and have uh, two grandchildren. So that worked out, but at the time it wasn't. All right, so then how did you end up back at Harvard for your first assistant professorship? Right. So the same woman, Ting Wu, uh, uh, decided about four, four months in that she didn't like Stanford, this project at Stanford, so she went and started her own institute and got her own grants, and she was acting like an assistant professor, like instantly, um, back on the East Coast, though. Uh, and so I said, well, I better clean up you know, my loose ends as fast as I can. So I, I cut my postdoc short by about a factor of two. So I didn't use the whole postdoctoral fellowship, just like I didn't use my whole graduate fellowship because I went down. And, uh, and I just scrambled to find something on the East Coast. And I was luck, very lucky to find uh, that Harvard would take me with, with such a pathetic postdoctoral career. I mean, it basically had done nothing post Biogen that was publishable. Uh, in that year, and uh, it was just a, kind of all over the map from embryonic stem cells to some crystallographic things to uh, the genome project, which was a, a non a non project at the time, but it was I was working on it, and but they they gave me uh, another chance. I mean, I I have to say Harvard continually picked up the pieces of my failed career. Um, and they did it again when I came up for tenure. So at least three times they've, they've uh, saved my bacon when I was not doing such a good job of saving myself. So is that why you've stayed all this time? 
I don't feel an obligation. I just think it's a, a great, uh, you know, it, it tolerates thinking out of the box. Uh, they have uh, terrific students and postdocs there, and uh, it's not just Harvard, it's MIT, the whole Boston community is kind of a, a biotech powerhouse. So it's, it's, a, it's a drug that's very hard to, to go cold, cold turkey on. Is it true you have the biggest lab at Harvard? I, I don't know. I haven't really, I, I guess, probably. <laughs> How many people do you have in your lab at present? So it's kind of a uh, steady state for, you know, over a decade at 100. Uh, uh, in the summer, it gets a little bigger than that because we have um, undergrad um, interns there, but about 100. Okay, so you worked on so many impactful things in biomedicine, it's hard to pick out just a few to cover in the next maybe 20 minutes, but can we start with the human genome? Because you were one of the very few people who was instrumental in getting the human genome project started. Um, but it's been noted that you perhaps didn't think they did all that they could with the initial $3 billion investment. Yeah, I was uh, in the first discussions in 1984, which were DOE-centric, um, um, and, but it quickly changed to, you know, can we use current technology or slight variations on current technology to turn the crank and, and we thought we could do it for a dollar a base. But I was, very, I was immediately disappointed because I wanted to bring the price down radically and do diploid genomes, meaning something that would be clinically valuable where, uh, because while three billion would, is sort of, you get half from your mother, half from your father, it would be as if you kind of mi mix those two together and, a, and it just didn't strike me as a good goal. So I thought the goals were, were misaligned. With, so I, I just, I became a, uh, conscious objector of my own project and, and uh, spent the whole genome project uh, on a very low budget developing new technology rather than spending the three billion dollars on, uh, on, on genome. So as I noted before, much of your work has been, or subsequent work in this world, has been towards bringing the, the price down. How much does it cost now and how little time does it take to sequence a human genome? Right, so well, the first one is a little bit fuzzy, but it, it, it uh, if you, depends on whether you started in 1984 or 1990 or 1995, but anyway, it's, it was uh, on the order of a couple of decades and $3 billion, and now it is uh, days or, um, and uh, maybe $300 cost. Um, and the price now to the in, to, to certain individuals is 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 on the order of a zero dollars. It's just like um, Google offers searches and maps and so forth f for free. Somebody pays it, but it, the price is so the cost is so low that you can make the price zero. And that's that's my intention with every technology is to bring the cost down to the point where everybody can get it for zero dollars. Kind of like smallpox is zero dollars because it's extinct. Do you think every human should have their genome sequenced? I don't know if there's a should. I think they should have the opportunity. Um, it, uh, you know, there's some people that, for whatever reason, don't use automobiles. Uh, th th this, yeah, I mean, I, I can't drive because I'm narcoleptic. So it's, a, it's case by case, but I, I would guess that there might be billions of people that, that, could that would want it and would benefit, and I think we're uh, we have the right price point now. What we need is to educate people about the, the value, and, uh, and, the, and now we also have privacy tools that can make it so that there's abs you know, um, all, essentially no risk of, um, yeah, you can get things that are medically actionable and not um, have to share your genome, you, you retain control of it. So has that been one of the main stumbling blocks, the privacy issues? You have famously put all of your records in your genome in the public domain. Has anyone tried to steal your identity? Uh, no, there haven't been any negative consequences, but that's not an argument that it's safe. I mean, I didn't do it as to show that, hey, you know, join me with the killer whales, the water's safe. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it was, we need both the highly private version and we need a highly public version, and we only need a few volunteers for the highly public version because there's a lot of things you can do with a small number of people, but the private version really, I mean, almost everybody 
should have that opportunity. So it was, you need, you need both, and that's, that was, uh, and the IRB requested that I be one of the first guinea pigs, and it's very convenient to pull blood and skin from my body, uh, and ethically better than pulling it from my students. So are most of the experiments done in your lab on your own cells? Yeah, most of them are, are, at this point, there's kind of a legacy component as well as an ethics component for why we should do it on somebody that's properly consented and, uh, I guess, enthusiastic. <laughs> Changing topics a little bit um, towards more genetic engineering. Yeah. This has been another one of the main thrusts in your lab, both from starting with things like homologous recombination up yeah. through uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 that you've been working yeah. on more recently. Yeah. Some of the applications in, some of the many applications in your lab have been gene drives in mosquitoes to eradicate malaria, potentially, to using CRISPR on, was it 62 different porcine endogenous retrovirus genes at once to potentially turn pig organs into being suitable for human transplantation. And then I think the one that has captured most of the public's attention, things like reactivating woolly mammoth genes using CRISPR and transplanting that into African elephants, genes potentially for both species conservation as well as climate change concerns. So, I mean, you, you work almost as a science fiction writer would. So are we at, is this the next frontier for genetic engineering? Is this going to be more prevalent in our daily lives, do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's, I mean, a lot of these things have quickly transitioned from science fiction to fact. Uh, um, to uh, some of them are even in routine use. Uh, it's not, uh, you want to prioritize. I mean, not everything that's in science fiction, some of them are undesirable. You know, like as some people would say, probably Gattaca has got a lot of undesirable components. Uh, so you want to, pri and, and, but the point is we are enabled suddenly by these exponential uh, growth we, you, uh, in quality and, uh, and cost effectiveness. So uh, the sort of things that are already in our daily life, I mean, there's millions of uh, families each year that use non-invasive prenatal testing, which is a consequence of the, of the uh, next-gen sequencing. Um, with synthetic biology, there's a growing number of green chemistry applications, flavor, flavors, fragrances, uh, uh, you know, complex uh, polymers that are made um, biologically rather than uh, with petroleum or, or high temperatures. So, um, and this is just going to expand. I mean, I, I have speculated that, that essentially everything that we can currently manufacture today um, without biology, we will also be able to manufacture with biology and with p potential advantages so that biology is intrinsically atomically precise and it's scalable to, to cover the whole planet essentially for free. Right now the planet is covered with atomically precise biological objects um, and that didn't cost anybody any money. It's just a matter of you know, exactly how we want to harness it. So I, I think that uh, we're in a truly revolutionary phase and we need to be very uh, thoughtful. Including things like uh, using CRISPR on humans? Well we are using CRISPR and other gene therapies on humans. There are not only uh, humans in clinical trials, there are now three approved gene therapies. N none of them are CRISPR, but CRISPR is approved for clinical trials. Um, I think the, the, probably what you're alluding to is, is there a barrier between doing it in child, adults, children, fetuses, embryos without germline, embryos with germline, and, and so forth, and these are, uh, under discussion, and, and, and ha even those, even the most off the table things have been tested now. So we've got enhanced uh, in a germline. It's already, it's already, the experiment has been done, um, but there are many more th that could be done, and it's a, it's a matter of having that discussion and seeing whether the benefits outweigh the risks. So one of the other things that your lab is working on is trying to determine whether or not it's possible to halt or reverse aging. Um, so I'm interested, especially because it seems like you are being very thoughtful about what the ethical considerations are around these things. So 
What are your thoughts on what does that mean for if you can make this work um, for the sustainability of the planet? Things like if we have more people who are not dying, what does that mean for the agricultural grid, the transportation, and also stratification of wealth? If it's something that you can purchase, does this cause more income disparity? So let's start with the income disparity first, because uh, it is one of my top concerns. You know, one of the things that, w ha as you mentioned, is a theme in my research is bringing down the cost. And I've seen the cost of reading and writing DNA, we've helped it come down 10 million fold. And I think that can be applied to almost everything. And that many things can be brought down to zero um, to the consumer. Um, and I think that's also true for aging reversal. Um, it's it, it, uh, 90% of uh, death in industrialized nations is due to diseases that don't kill 20 year olds for the most part. And so um, if we want to have a, a healthier, more youthful uh, life, uh, just even extending it um, by reversal, reversal is just easier to prove that you've done something in a short period of time for uh, both scientific and, and regulatory reasons. Um, so I think that that should be something that's equitably distributed as soon as, as early as in the process as possible. Um, now in terms of uh, um, overpopulation, we have uh, the curious contrary force that might, we might partially cancel out, which is that as people move to cities, which is essentially everybody on the planet is moving to cities, I've seen estimates sort of from 58 percent to 80 some percent, um, they drop their expectations from seven children per family to, to 1.2, which is below replacement level. So that's, that's one force that might work in the opposite direction. There's also where we should and inevitably will colonize other planets and moons in our solar system. Um, they're really much closer than that may seem, and, uh, and that will cause a, a drain, just as um, colonizing uh, the New World several times uh, caused a drain on um, first Asia and then um, Europe. So um, I think that hopefully the combination of those two things will, um, and the, uh, for, for in terms of population and the equitable distribution and the fact it's not going to happen overnight, sh sh we should be able to handle it. Uh, I think it, it's better than the alternative, which is to say, oh, we should just kill people or allow them to die in order to solve all these problems. What do you think the next 10 years holds for you and your research? I w am addicted to technology development, um, I, and especially transformative and broad uh, things that affect multiple fields. So reading and writing DNA, you could argue, uh, affects almost every field of of biology and a number of non-biological fields. We're uh, getting more and more into manufacturing things out of inorganic materials um, like computers. Uh, so I think I'm getting more and more interested in, um, in space uh, genetics and, and things and uh, sending objects or entities to Alpha Centauri that can radio back uh, biological engineering of such uh, objects, um, interested in, in manufacturing electronics or the moral equivalent electronics, which might be brains, uh, actual fully biological brains that can compete with artificial intelligence. So these are sorts of things that I will be adding to all. I, we, we never drop anything. I'm still doing the same thing, some of the same things I was doing as a teenager, like crystallography and transfer RNA. They're still two of my favorite things. If you could not be a scientist, what other vocation do you think you would have taken up? <laughs> the cheap an answer is engineering. <laughs> In fact, it took me years to realize I was actually more of an engineer than I was a scientist. Okay, so then uh, let me rephrase it. Artist would, be, artist would be the next one, but I think that that's also a cheat because the, the practical arts it was a term for engineering at one point. And I have an artist in my lab, actually sometimes multiple that he brings in. Um, but they, they, what they do is they do impractical engineering, which uh, starts you to ask, 
not only what, why, but why not? What you know, the, the realm of the possible rather than the practical. And then you then you can then we morph that into something practical. So I like art. I was uh, originally uh, going to major in cinematography. Uh, my first uh, semester in college was uh, a cinematography major, and uh, and I at it, when I first uh, started looking for a lab, one of the things I liked about the crystallography lab is they actually had a scanner where you could scan in photographs. And I had been looking for such a scanner for years because I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could like scan a photograph and then you could manipulate it in the computer? And just like everybody I asked about that just said, why would you want to do that? You know, it's like, you know, and then, you know, years later we have Adobe Photoshop and, you know, um, you know, a huge fraction of uh, animation is now done with computer manipulated imaging. Can you recall your first scientific experiment that you ever did? Even as a child? Oh, yeah. So there were, uh, yeah, vividly. Um, well, I, I may have forgot one, but the ones I remember are vivid. Uh, so I, I, uh, one was an inadvertent where I, I took a dragonfly nymph out of the pond. I was always digging around in ponds, and there's this really fierce looking dragonfly nymph. I didn't know the name of it at the time, I didn't even know what kind of animal it was, but put it in a jar, and uh, one day it disappeared. And, uh, and I unscrewed the lid and there was a dragonfly on the top. And I said, how did a dragonfly get through a solid jar with a lid on it um, to eat my uh, dragonfly nymph? I mean, I wasn't calling him by name. I was just saying, how did this creature eat my creature? And, and then I, I, I was mildly dyslexic, so I was, I was looking through books by pictures to find the answer and I eventually figured it out on my own that what it was. Now, it wasn't really an experiment per se. It was kind of more observational. It was kind of the old fashioned biology. First experiment was probably, uh, so that was when I was 10, nine-ish. Uh, when I was uh, 13, 13, 14, I became obsessed with carnivorous plants and I wanted to make big carnivorous plants. <laughs> and so I studied uh, uh, gibberellic acid, uh, which is a plant hormone that causes growth. And so it worked on my bean plants, but it did not, fortunately, did not work on the Venus flytrap. Just a presaging Little Shop of Horror. I, right? I think I, I think it presaged it. Yeah, it was it was, it was seventy. Uh, no, it was sixty eight. Yeah. Do you have a favorite scientific word? Scientific word, multiplexing. Yeah, I was thinking about legally changing my middle initial from it's, it's M already to multiplexing. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite color? Um, it keeps changing. It, will, it you know uh, I, I would say today it's uh, fifteen. 150 nanometers, which is a popular infrared uh, wavelength for telecommunications. You might win the prize for the most scientific and nerdy answer I've ever gotten to that question. Thank you so much for joining me today. It has been a real pleasure hearing more about your work. Okay, thank you. Yeah.